Take your Bibles. Let's start in the book of Acts. We're going to end up in several places. Exodus, Matthew. We're just going to go all over the Bible, which is what I'm apt to do. And um, the, the sort of the series that I'm in is found in verse 23 of Acts 28. And uh, we'll start in verse 17 and read our way down. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer. We're going to pray for Brother Sterling. And uh, pray that God lifts him up. We're going to pray for Alicia. She is very sick today. Michael is sick today. Courtney is sick today. And uh, it's packet week. Huh? I don't know. I don't want it. Yeah. Roy is sick today. He's high blood pressure. So high blood pressure is going around too. So anyway, and it's packet week. So, yeah. So anyway, pray. And then uh, there's a young lady named Erin. And... Uh, She's called here a little while ago. I am sure that she is asking for your prayers. I'll probably be able to explain more maybe a little bit later on. Uh, but she's been following us online for a while. And uh, so she, uh, she definitely needs God's people praying for her. And uh, she'll need God's people helping her. So we're going to pray for Aaron tonight. All right. Let's uh, read the scriptures and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Acts 28, verse 17, it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. When they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of for this cause. Therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with his chain. And they said unto him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came shewed or spake any harm of thee. Verse 22, but we desire to hear with thee what thou thinkest for as concerning this sect. And he's speaking of the Christians. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. Get used to that. Get used to that. The world is changing. And get used to the Bible believers being spoken against. Not the other ones. Not the other churches. The Bible believers being spoken against. Verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day... There came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. That was one long sermon. I ought to do that one day. I ought to. Yeah, homecoming. I do. Yeah, homecoming. So anyway, but uh, persuading them concerning Jesus out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And so that's the, that's the series. It's, it's just an interesting study to go find Jesus in the Old Testament because he's there. He's everywhere. He's there. Last, the last part of this, we talked about Adam, Christ being the second Adam. And tonight we're going to talk about Moses, the lawgiver, Jesus, the lawgiver. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing tonight. And I thank you, Lord, for being very good to us. And I thank you, Lord, for... Uh, these folks that have gathered here tonight, these folks that have gathered with us online, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them. Father, we have a lot of sickness going around in our church. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, give comfort, give aid, give blessing to those that are sick, those that are hurting. Be with Brother Sterling in the hospital. And I pray, God, Lord, that you would just give healing to him and to Brother Roy as well. And to my daughters, I pray, God, that you'd bless them, help them. And Father, Lord, we pray for Miss Aaron. 
We pray, dear God, that you would give her comfort, give her grace. And Lord, just go with her, bless her. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that uh, uh, Lord, you would watch over her, give her protection. Father, she has great need in her life, and I pray, dear God, that you would fill that need. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask you blessing on your word tonight. Father, may it, uh, may it teach us, may it guide us, instruct us, Lord, in the law and in wisdom. I pray, dear God, that you would just fill us full of knowledge and give us understanding of your word, and by that we'll have wisdom in this life and in the days to come. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. Let's look at Moses and the beginning of his life. In, we're going we're gonna to look at Moses, and we're going to see uh, the type and the foreshadowing of Christ and his coming. There are two lawgivers in the Bible. There are two covenants. And there are two covenant mediators. Moses, the first covenant, was God making a covenant, a promise, and establishing government over the people of Israel. He met them at Mount Sinai, gave them his law at the hand of Moses, who was their mediator. We have the second covenant, the new covenant. The first covenant was a covenant of obedience, strict obedience, perfect obedience. No man has ever accomplished that. No man has ever done that. So now God supplies a new covenant. This is a covenant of grace through faith. We cannot obey, but we can believe. We can trust in God and what he's saying. So it had to be given, since it's a new covenant, it was given in a new language, and it was given from heaven at the hands of a better mediator, an eternal one. Moses died, Christ died, but he lives again, and he's still the mediator of this new covenant. So we're going to see the shadows. In Exodus chapter 1, we have the birth of Moses, and we have them already before Moses is born, Trying to kill Moses. Let's look at it. Exodus chapter 1 verse 15. The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. Of which the name of the one was Shifra. And the other, name of the other Pua. And he said when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women. And see them upon the stools. If it be a son then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. And did not as the king of Egypt commanded them. But saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing? And have saved the men children alive. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as Egyptian women, they are lively. And are delivered, I guess she was saying the Egyptian women are lazy in childbirth. The Hebrew women are lively. And air delivered our, air, and, and our delivered air, the midwives, came in unto them. In other words, by the time we get there, the baby's already been born. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. God blessed those midwives. Now, Pharaoh, still intent on killing. And my theory is, the devil is behind this. The devil is behind this because... I think the devil, the devil was told in Genesis 3 that the seed of the woman, the offspring of a woman, was going to bruise his head. In other words, crush his head, defeat him. So the devil has been on the lookout for this seed of the woman, for this child. I think he senses that this child is about to be born. And so his, he is the one behind Pharaoh killing. He's not, he's letting the women, he's letting the girls be born and live, but he wants the sons killed. It's because he thinks that the savior or a savior is coming. And so in verse 22, since we can't get the midwives to do it, 
Verse 22, Pharaoh charged all his people saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. I think the devil sensed that a savior, a deliverer, was about to be born. So let's skip forward now to the birth of Christ. Matthew chapter 2. Turn there. Give the devil a headache. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. So they tried to kill Moses, and they tried to kill Jesus. Matthew 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Because Herod has asked, even though Pharaoh did not ask specifically, where's Moses? Herod has already heard that the king of the Jews has been born. He's already heard that. And he's inquiring then, where is he that is born king of the Jews? When they made diligent search, they looked in the, in fact, turn there, turn to the book of Malachi, if you would. Malachi, or excuse me, Micah. Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. The, this is, by the way, the 33rd book of the Bible. And they're looking for Jesus, King of the Jews. Where is he to be born? Micah chapter 5. It says, verse 2, but that, and this is what the, uh, the scribes instructed Herod. They were reading Micah 5, verse 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The, there is a doctrine being established here. That is the doctrine of the everlasting Christ. He is, he is goings forth have been from old, from, let's see, the past would be this way. From everlasting in the past, Christ always was, is, and always shall be. Christ, God did not come up with Christ in A.D. 0. It was not an afterthought of God. It was not God saying, oh, I don't have a son. I'll give Mary a son and she'll, then he'll be my son and then he'll be Jesus. No, Jesus always was. Remember what Jesus told the people, before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, that inflamed them because they knew that God's name was I am. Am. And they knew that Jesus was making the claim that he was the one who told Moses, I am that I am. Tell them I am sent me. So when Jesus makes that claim, he is, he is claiming that he has always been. And that's what Micah 5 is saying, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The new translations. Take this verse and say whose origins have been from old, from ancient times. His origins, meaning that Jesus had a beginning. Not so. Amen? Not so. You destroy the doctrine of the everlasting Christ when you change that verse. And that's what they've done. Reason 8,962 why we stick with the King James. Amen? So anyway, back to uh, Matthew chapter 2. Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed where? Isn't it interesting that now God is going to once again call his son out of Egypt. Israel, God called Israel his son, and he said, I have called my son out of Egypt. That was in the days of Moses. And here, once again, he tells Joseph to take Mary and the baby and go to Egypt 
So God can fulfill the scripture again out of Egypt. Have I called my son? Isn't that neat? Okay, and there was, and so was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt, have I called my son? This is the second time now God has called his son out of Egypt. He called Israel, his firstborn son, out of Egypt. Now Christ is being called out of Egypt. So you see, that anyway, you get it. Matthew 2, turn there, Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod... When he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. I am going to do a Watchman broadcast on abortion. God gave me the idea Friday morning, and it's going to involve what you're reading here. There is a spirit that the Bible is making you aware of. That when that spirit gets in people, they can murder children and not have a guilty conscience over it. Pharaoh told the Egyptians... When the Jewish boys are born, you throw them in the river. Herod sent soldiers into Bethlehem and killed every child under two years old. Small, little children, Roland's age. Killed every one of them and his conscience doesn't bother him. The Jews... Pass their children through the fire unto Molech. And their conscience did not bother them. There is a spirit that the Bible makes you aware of. Whereby people can kill children and not feel guilty about it. That's every abortion clinic in the world. They can kill children and not feel guilty about it. You remember a few years ago, a guy went into a church because in that church was a doctor who ran the local abortion mill. And the guy went in the church, found that doctor, and killed him in that church. There's a man sitting inside a church who kills babies, and apparently he doesn't feel guilty in his church church something something wrong with that church something's wrong with that church amen so anyway he slew all the children that were in bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men he was looking for jesus and he said i'll just kill every one of them to make sure i get the right one then was fulfilled that which was spoken by jeremy the prophet saying in ramah was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, you want to hear the sad part of this? If you find, I think this is in the prophet, this is in the book of Jeremiah. If you go read where this is in Jeremiah, you will find that there are unfulfilled prophecies in that same passage. That tells me that this isn't perfectly fulfilled yet. It tells me that there is coming a time when Rachel is going to weep for her children once again. Murder of children. Amen? That's scary. So anyway, so we see in Moses, Moses about to be born and Pharaoh killing all the Jewish males in order to prevent Moses from being born. But God finds a way. God finds a way. And what's funny is, in the very, the very man who ordered all of the babies to be born, that same man ended up raising the one that he should have killed. He ends up raising him in his house. Amen. That's funny to me. Amen. God just, has, God just can do that kind of stuff. Amen. Now back to Exodus 3. Turn there. 
Moses is now called to be a savior. That's who Moses. He was called Moses because he was drawn out of water. Okay, apparently that's what Moses means. Because Pharaoh's daughter found him because Moses' sister uh, put the baby into a little ark, a little boat, sent him down the river. Pharaoh's daughter, bathing in the river, finds him floating down the river, takes the boy, raises him as Pharaoh's son. Which to me is funny. It's hilarious. Okay? So anyway, now we have Moses being called to be a savior. In Exodus 3, verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. This is Moses meeting God at the burning bush. He said, moreover, he said, I'm the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. You might want to underline that in your Bible. God knows your sorrows. And God sends a Savior to you. Amen. When you cry out, when you're tired of the chains, God will send a Savior. I'm come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. But God said, I've come. I am going to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. The phrase to be saved literally means to be delivered. Now, how do I know that? Because in Joel chapter 2, he says that uh, your sons and your daughters shall, shall prophesy, you old men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. And he said that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. But when Peter quotes that, he says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation is deliverance. Deliverance from your sin. Deliverance from the life that you live. Deliverance from the bondage that you were in. That's what God, when God saves you, He delivers you from all of those things. So Moses is now being called as the deliverer. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Give the devil a heart attack. Turn those pages in your Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. But while, but while he thought, this is Joseph, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. See, Joseph, he's being told now that his espoused wife, Mary, who is still a virgin, he's being told that now she is with child. And Joseph's going, I didn't do it. He's afraid and he's thinking about writing her a bill of divorce and putting her away because that's what the law would have required. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Let me just throw this in. The Mormons, they have it wrong. Mormon doctrine, does anybody know what it says? Mormon doctrine says that God, Elohim, the Father, came down to the earth, knocked on, they made a cartoon of this. The Mormon church made a, a teaching video where God is knocking on Mary's door. Mary opens the door and God goes in and mates with her. That's Mormon doctrine. If that's true, she's now defiled. That's not how it happened. Her virginity is preserved. The Holy Ghost conceived in her. And that's how it happened. Amen? That's what the Bible said. That which to conceive there is the Holy Ghost. Joseph believes that. He believes what God told him in that dream. So, verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. The Hebrew is Yeshua. We related to the name Joshua, and it's related to Hosea, Isaiah, um, Elisha, 
And what all of those words mean is it's the Hebrew word for salvation or God saves. That's what Jesus means in Hebrew. Yahshua, Jehovah saves is what it means. For he shall save his people from their sins. Moses called to be the savior, called to be the deliverer. Jesus is called Jesus because it means Jehovah saves for he shall save his people from their sins. They're both called to be the savior. Look at the book of Acts chapter seven. In the book of Acts chapter seven, we have Stephen preaching his last message. If in my lifetime, when I preach whatever's going to be my last message, if God lets me know it's my last, mas last message, I'm going to turn it loose. Because that's what Stephen did. Stephen now is on trial. Remember, Stephen is not a pastor. He's not a bishop. He's not an evangelist. What is he? He's a deacon. He's one of the first seven deacons that were called. And the deacons basically were to be the helpers. But Stephen's got it in him. Uh, Linda and I remember a, a gentleman by the name of Tryman Messer. Who was, uh, he was saved up in, I think, in Topeka, Kansas at a little church. And him and his wife started attending there and he became a deacon there. Well, the pastor left. And just left a handful of people in that church. And they didn't have anybody to fill the pulpit. So they picked Tryman Messer, the deacon, and said... You're preaching Sunday. We don't have anybody else. So he got up and preached his first message. For years after that, he pastored that church as a deacon pastor of that church. Went from like five families to over five or six hundred people. He was a soul winner. Chime and Messer knocked doors and he wasn't afraid to talk to people. And But God can use deacons in amazing ways. But here's Stephen and all he is a deacon. But he's been preaching everywhere and now he's on trial... And the Jewish government hates his guts. They hate what he's doing. And they got him on trial. And Stephen turns loose on them. He's preaching to Jews. And you ought to read Acts chapter 7 and read the sermon that Stephen preached. Because it's full of stories about Jesus in the Old Testament. Everything that Stephen preaches, he preaches typology and how every one of these Types in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says. Acts chapter 7 verse 23. When he was full 40 years old. 40 years old. The number 4 for Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This is a prefiguring of the four gospels. When he was a full 40 years old. Talking about Moses. It came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong. He defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. What happened was Moses saw, Moses now is an Egyptian. He's raised by Pharaoh, but he knows that he's a Jew. So he goes to see how his people are doing. And he sees an Egyptian man uh, being cruel to a Jew. Well, it makes Moses mad. Moses goes over and kills the Egyptian. Slew him. Murdered him. Buried the body. And left. You see... He thought that he would be seen by his people as being one who stood up for his people and one who was in favor of his people and one that was going to help his people. But when the Jews saw him the next day, they looked at Moses and they said, what, you come to kill us as well? They, his own people, watch this, his own people rejected him. You see Jesus here? Full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. So what happened? Moses had to flee Egypt and leave his people in bondage. So where did he go? He went out and met a Gentile wife. He went out and married a Gentile wife, Jethro's daughter. 
and was with her for how long? Does anybody know? 40 years. So he left his people because they didn't want him. They rejected him. And so he left and went, to be, and, went and actually saved the Gentile women, of the Gentile daughters of Jethro because they were being harassed and Moses defended them. Moses a fighter. He goes and defends Jethro's daughters, ends up marrying one of his daughters, marries a Gentile bride. Do you get that? So then he gets to come back to be the savior of his people. That's Jesus. It's beautiful. He supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, we see Jesus on the cross, and Jesus is actually defending his brethren Israel and slaying his enemies in his death. Colossians 2, 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Moses was acting as Christ when he slew the Egyptian, standing up for his own people, but his own people didn't want him. They said, crucify him. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11. He came into his own, and his own received him not. He's talking about Israel. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Turn your Bible to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Talking about... His, uh, when Stephen was talking about Moses, he goes to his brethren, Israel, but his brethren understood not. And that reminded me of Mark chapter 15. When Jesus was on the cross, verse 32. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. That's his own people mocking him. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was Jesus doing here when he said that? Does anybody know? He was quoting scripture. He's quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 says, they parted my garments and cast lot from my vesture. Psalm 22 says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22 talks about how they mocked him. And the things that happened to Jesus on the cross was recorded in Psalm 22. And Jesus tried to open their eyes to that by quoting that chapter. Because those people at the cross saw him. They saw his garments parted. And they were casting lots for his vesture. They saw the people mock him. They saw that they pierced his hands and feet. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If the Jews would have had their eyes open and understood, they would have known that the Messiah was being crucified exactly the way it was written in their own Bible, the Old Testament, Psalm 22. But look at what they said. Some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calleth Elias or Elijah. They did not understand Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. They had no idea what Jesus was saying. And he was quoting their Bible. But they didn't understand. Darkness covered their eyes. The veil of Moses was over their eyes and they could not see their own Messiah. Just like Moses killing the Egyptian and his brethren understood not that Moses would have saved him right then. But they didn't want him. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, turn back there. Verse 37, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Stephen is recalling these very knowable facts to the Sanhedrin. To the Jewish elders. He's quoting their Bible to them. And this is what makes them. This is why they killed him. 
they realized what he was getting at. He was trying to show how Jesus fulfills all of these passages in the Old Testament. And they hated him for it, and they had him stoned. And who was holding the coats of the people that were stoning Stephen? Saul. The Apostle Paul, before he's saved, he's holding their coats while they're doing it. And he's, anyway, he said, verse 38, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Remember in uh, Numbers 14, when they were confronted with going into the promised land and facing the giants, the Jews said, let us make us a captain and let us go back into Egypt. They rejected Moses. And because of that, God made them wander 40 years in the wilderness until all of them died. And here we have the prophecy of the prophet, Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. Notice the King James translators capitalized the letter P in prophet. They knew who that was. Verse 19, And it came to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. God knowing. That when he sent Jesus to the Jews, that they were not going to listen to the words that God put in his mouth. God knew it. So in John chapter 7, there were some who believed. John chapter 7, verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. They knew what God had promised through Moses, that there would be a prophet come in the name of God and that they should hearken unto his words. And so many of the people were believing of a truth. This is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Well, that's where Jesus, but they didn't know it. So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, taken him to kill him, but no man laid hands on him. And then we have John chapter 4, turn there. The woman at the well. The woman at the well knew who Jesus was. And she was only a Samaritan. Who were the Samaritans? Half Jews. And the full-blooded Jews hated them. They despised them. This, this Samaritan woman, this half-breed Jew woman, the woman at the well, verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And look, here we are. We're not in Jerusalem. We're at the base of Buck Knob over here. That's the mountain over here in Crystal City. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She believed. A half Jew. But she believed. Moses, just like Jesus, 
rejected by his own people. Forty years earlier than when Moses delivered them, they could have been delivered. Had they chosen to follow Moses, he would have led them. But they rejected him and forced him out of their midst. So he goes and he becomes the bridegroom or the husband of a Gentile bride. Then God sends him back. Just like Jesus is coming back, God sent Moses back again to Egypt to be the deliverer of his people. And Jesus is coming back to be the Savior of his people. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you for the word that was given tonight. Father, may it be a blessing to people. Father, open up our eyes. Teach us wondrous things out of your word. Father, we pray for those that are sick tonight. We pray, God, that you would give them healing. Bless those, Lord, that are traveling. Father, be with those that are hurting tonight and just need God's people to be there for them. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless these that have come tonight. Thank you, Father, for meeting with us. We love you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.